Bridging the Gap with Dr. Jacob Wilson. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Jacob Wilson. I'm here with Charlie Ottinger, and you're here on an episode of Bridging the Gap. If this is your first time uh, to the channel, make sure that you hit that like button, um, subscribe, and if you really want to support the channel, if you love this content, make sure you share this um, with your friends and people that you know. Today is going to be a really exciting topic, which is um, do bigger muscles actually mean that you're stronger? Right? We got a surprise for everybody here. Um, we're talking about programming, training, gaining size. We've actually created an entire bodybuilding program for you, and you can receive that 100%. It's our gift to you today. Um, just head over to themusclephd.com. You'll see a box pop up that'll prompt you uh, where to put your email so that we can send you that program and you can get to growing. All right, guys, we got another surprise for you. Um, we, we're doing all this education, talking about all these cool topics. Well, what if you could learn and know basically almost everything that science currently has to say about gaining size, where you could know as much as someone who walked out with their, to me, advanced uh, graduate degree on the topic? Um, what if you could know more than 99% of the population? Well, that's something that Charlie and I um, want to want to give to you, and so we actually create the the Muscle PhD Academy. It's listen to this. It's a 30-week course, where we're basically taking probably 30 years of information and condensing it into 30 weeks. You're going to learn everything you could possibly imagine. I mean, when I'm talking about everything, how muscles grow, why they grow, reps, sets, rest period lengths, nutrition. Uh, training, periodization, bench squat, deadlift, every single body part, you name it, you're going to learn about it in these next 30 weeks. Um, but we got a real cool clip for you, a uh, uh, preview of the academy. Check it out. So pro muscle proteins are also built from amino acids. And we have how many, I'll let you guess, how many amino acids do you think we have? 20. You got it right. So we have 20 amino acids, okay? And what happens is, why are they called amino acids? They have an amino group, and they have a carboxyl group or an acid group. So an amino group and a carboxyl or an acid group. So amino acid. And every, every amino acid has that. But then they have what's called a variable group or an R group. That variable group takes 20 different combinations, if that makes sense. 20 different combinations, okay? So you have 20 amino acids that you find. Just from a personal standpoint, do you know a lot of big guys that aren't like, you know, a lot stronger than the normal population? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's they, they say the, the the beach muscles, right? They yeah. look good, but they don't perform well. Yeah, you know. Yeah, we've seen that before, right? We have seen that before, and you know, and it's interesting too. I think. Um, l let me say this. I think that obviously, if you have a lot of muscle, you'll be stronger than most people. But what we're really talking about is a pound for pound basis. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like for example, probably um, when I did, when I was more bodybuilding, my best physique, I was actually um, not strong at all. I mean, not strong at all. I probably, I was, I was struggling with three, three sets of 10 with 275 on squats. But when I was my strongest, I was pretty small and I was like, uh, you know, probably 172 and, you know, if uh, I could squat probably completely raw with no like knee pads, 480 and probably if I did wraps, I could squat over 500, but I was small. So um, that's just anecdotally, right? But, um, but what's the relationship? What I want to talk about is, it, is there a relationship between muscle size and strength? I, you know, we can look at this from both <clears throat> applied and anecdotal. We can also look at this from research, right? There, there's some research on it, not enough. There's never enough, right? Yeah. These interesting topics that we actually care about. Um, but what we do in research is we do, you know, to look at the relationship between size and strength or even gains in size and gains in strength, we look at correlations, right? We've all heard correlations, not causation. And yes, just because two things are related doesn't mean that a variable A can predict variable B. That's causation. So I think the classic example we always hear is that 
uh, in summer, ice cream sales go up and murders go up at yeah. the same time. Does ice cream make you murder people? <laughs> I get happier when I have ice cream. You know? <laughs> but I'm this just is, thinking what Fernando yeah. would be thinking right now. <laughs> it's a correlation, but it's not a causation. But if you have two things that you expect to be related, in most finding, cases, yeah. yeah, finding a correlation between the two makes a lot of sense. So <laughs> we look at correlations in research, and we see that muscle size generally or usually is has a strong correlation to strength, especially if, say, we looked at bicep size and <clears throat> bicep strength, 1RM, maximum force, torque, whatever was measured, pretty good relationship right there. Same thing with the pecs. I mean, there's the best strength relationship that I found was between pecs and bench press 1RM. And we even showed that in our bench press study we talked about a few weeks ago, bigger pecs meant bigger bench press. For the most yeah, part. Yep. yeah, I think we found, uh, we, you ran a correlation on our research the other day, it was a correlation like point, almost point seven. Was yeah, it? it was high point sixes. Yeah. So point. So that means that you're explaining almost fifty percent, uh, statistically, almost fifty percent of the strength is explained by the size of the chest. And I think if you look at <clears throat> literature, we found all sorts of different correlations out there. Anywhere from like it could be low to sixty percent of the variance. 60% of strength was explained by how much, how big someone was. So that definitely means that like statistically speaking, there's a, there is a relationship between strength and size, okay? But the thing is that's kind of interesting here is it's not explaining every, all of it. That means that your ability to be strong, like even in our study, you only saw maybe 50% relationship between strength and size. So that means there's other things that are making people strong. And I think a lot of our viewers are obviously not just interested, they're not just interested in being big, they, they are interested in strength. Um, so actually when I um, was, when I was um, in grad school, <clears throat> one of my mentors was one of the pioneer researchers on this topic, on neural adaptations. And his name was Milner Brown and he actually got famous no one knows him today, but I mean, I, if you're a researcher, you know Milner Brown. I, I challenge you, if you look up any, look up neural adaptations to resistance training, if you look that topic up, you're gonna see Milner Brown, 1978 or something, cited. So what he did was, he did research where he, um, he looked at, like, thumb strength, <laughs> okay? So, but this is like control important stuff. <laughs> important stuff. <laughs> But back then, if you're doing like EMG, you know, you can isolate the thumb, it's pretty easy. So, but what he found was he looked at something called synchronization. So let's say, for example, that there was um, a big box and Charlie and I both had to move it. So let's say I go, Charlie's like, well, can you move that? And I go and I start pushing, I can't move it. And Charlie's like, well, you know what? He's not that strong anyway, so I'm gonna go push it. <laughs> so Charlie goes and he pushed it, it's like, damn, it's not moving much. And then he's like, all right, let's do it at the same time. And we go push it at the same time, it starts moving. Well, before, I was, we were pushing it one at a time, and after we were pushing it together. And basically what, what Milner Brown found was that that's what happens with muscles. You have all these muscle fibers, and they don't all push together at the same time when you're untrained. And the more you train uh, uh, in a certain way, you start to, all the muscle fibers start to fire what we call synchronously or together. So this means that there, this is the, what we call software. So in other words, what Milner Brown found is that the software could almost be rewritten, okay? And we call those neural adaptations. And so the software, the program can get better. Even though you have the same muscles, the program can get better for how the muscles are used, right? Is, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. And I think, <clears throat> You know, the synchronization, or I, you also see that called coordination, right? But it's essentially coordination or synchronization of motor units or neuromuscular compartments of individual muscles. And that is a unique adaptation that falls under something that we call neuromuscular adaptations. So obviously, when you get stronger, gaining muscle is part of gaining strength, right? But the other part of that is the neuromuscular aspect. And, and, <clears throat> in a lot of sports, especially that are weight class constrained, 
neuromuscular adaptations are what we want to go after because that shouldn't affect your body weight. Yeah. The muscle's not getting bigger. That's a peripheral adaptation. We're looking at the, the, essentially the link between the muscle and the brain. How can we improve that? So synchronization or coordination is one of those, and there's probably at least three others that are worth covering anyways. Oh, yeah, and I think actually it would be cool too because you got a lot of large programming background here. Let's go ahead, if we just tell them the adaptation, then give a practical application on like how to train for it. Yeah, so, yeah, let's do that. So let's just say someone is, um, so we'll go through these adaptations and see what you guys can take away from a programming perspective here. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> what intramuscular coordination type of thing, what, what do you think on building that? I think we see this a lot of times with <clears throat> if someone is new to lifting, they're not as, they don't express strength equal to how strong they actually are. Yeah. Because they're not coordinated at all. Yeah. So I think that's just motor learning in a sense, yeah. right? Perform compound movements and take your time in progressing them because you're wanting to make sure that they're doing them properly because that's how motor learning happens. Yep. You want to get a proper pattern down right away ingrain that pattern over time you know four five six sets of ten reps make the reps perfect week to week to week you can start to add weight progress to more you know difficult variations and as that time goes they're going to become more synchronous more coordinated because they're getting better at performing that move so what charlie i think is saying too here and i think is important is that when we think okay when i was um when i again when i was in school one of my men other mentors dr donald sawyer um, one of the best lecturers I've ever met in, in my life. But he asked um, everyone in class, he goes, what's strength? You know, and, I'm, and a bunch of people raised their hands and I'm like, I gave a textbook answer. I'm like, the ability to exert uh, force on an external object. You know what I mean? I, I gave the textbook answer, right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> by the end of the lecture, what he said was, he basically said, if you take a bunch of strength measures, they don't correlate very well. So he's going, okay, well, it's the ability to exert force against an external object, but if you correlate a bunch of measures, they don't really relate very well. Not many have high correlations. So what he goes is, well, what are you measuring then? What are you measuring when you're measuring a bench press? What are you measuring when you're measuring a squat? What are you measuring when you're measuring a deadlift? And he goes, you're measuring the ability of an individual to bench press, to squat, to deadlift. It's a skill. It's a skill. So what Charlie's talking about, you have to understand is that, like, um, and that's what Sawyer said. He says it's measuring the skill of an of an individual. And so um, w if you think about when you're lifting weights, especially if you got someone start, first starting off, building a proper pattern is critical. Because what happens if someone actually builds an improper pattern? <laughs> it can just lead to all the problems that you could possibly get. Yeah. I mean, you're talking uh, asymmetries, compensations, leading to injury, and now they're at a point where they've ingrained that improper pattern. They have to do physical therapy to unlearn that pattern. Yep, you exactly. Know, that's obviously a stretch, but <clears throat> it happens. We see it all the time. And so I think the biggest point is if you understand <clears throat> that it, you are programming software adaptations. When we're talking about strength, you're, program, you're working on the skill of the movement and you're programming software adaptations. So your form becomes critical uh, for whatever your goals are. And, and that can be for strength, but it can even be for a lot of other things as well. So, um, so proper technique is important. So what, what's another adaptation? How else can someone get stronger without getting I bigger? Think one that, that goes along with coordination or synchronization pretty well is just muscle activation in general. So synchronization or coordination is essentially activating the right muscles or the right portions of muscles at the right times. Muscle activation is just more activation in general. Yeah. You might have, I don't like the term, but dormant fibers maybe. Yeah. You know, there's different ideas and thoughts about this, but <clears throat> we see very routinely in studies that you have a baseline uh, activation rate, trained for 12 weeks, that act activation rate's increased. You got better at activating that target muscle. And I think that kind of goes hand in hand with motor unit coordination. And I think really, if we look at this from a learning perspective, 
what I like to do with people who are new to training is I want to get you lifting a weight right away because having that resistance whether it's in your hands on your back or whatever you know whatever you're ready for having something to push against is what forces these adaptations to occur at a, at a quicker rate you know I I can't stand when I see a coach or a trainer begin with somebody they do body weight squats what's the point like yeah most people they need a weight they need a resistance to get into the correct positions you see most people they squat like trash with just their body weight right but you put a 20 pound dumbbell on their hands now it's fine now we're learning how to squat that's true so i think getting some type of resistance <clears throat> a if it's an athlete or a client you're working with now they're actually working out right away b you're getting more quality reps in with that resistance which leads to better overall adaptations in these these muscle activation related factors so give me like when you're talking about so okay so when basically when someone starts lifting weights they can't maximally activate the muscle mm -hmm. last week we talked on frequency about how if you look at the pecs they they are not, you can't you're not maximally voluntarily activating all the muscle tissue the larger the muscle the harder it is to activate um, so I think the biggest thing is that that's also a skill so what from, a, from lifting a weight, if someone's like, I want to get stronger, w is there a repetition range that maximizes the, yeah. that adaptation? Is there a rest period length? I mean, I, and we could even go back to our podcast we did a couple weeks ago <clears throat> about stimulating reps, right? But I think if we are specifically targeting activation as an adaptation, training heavy is going to be best, or training lighter weights but with maximum intended velocity. Really, any weight you do with maximum intended velocity or moving the weight as fast as you can, regardless of how heavy it is, that's probably going to be the best way to get your you know, voluntary activation percentages up and continue to do that because people get lazy all the time. You yeah. Know? It, now, there's an interest, interesting thing. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I was reading um, a book, and I, I should have read it again. It's been a long time. But there, you know, Vladimir Zaskiorsky. <laughs> Vladimir's that old school Russian guy, and he actually, when I was reading his book, he was um, uh, do, he was actually in the same university as William Kramer, and William Kramer again one of the um, all time greatest strength um, and conditioning scientists of all time. But he said that your true 1RM was only found during competition, which I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, 100%. But yeah, so let's go on this activation thing. Mm -hmm. Is there a mechanism, like, from an activation standpoint on why that might be? Ammonia caps? Yeah, ammonia <laughs> you know? could be. But, you know, yeah. I, I thought about it, but probably the, I think the biggest thing is I think that our bodies have protective mechanisms yeah. that are protect. They t You talk about, like, um, you guys have all heard of the story of the mom who like what happens the kid is going out and they're playing and uh, the kid I don't know a car backs over him you know what I mean yeah. and what do you read in the newspaper that this 120 pound woman lifts the car off her kid to save its life everyone's heard this story right mm -hmm. before so but what they don't tell you is afterward that the mom's in the hospital she's torn several muscles <laughs> and she's out for months <laughs> Which yeah. get, brings me to the point. Why does your body not be able to activate all of its muscle? Part of it's protective mechanisms, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. That we can unlock with arousal. And what more arousal can you have than competition? Right, right. And then that's like Doc's saying is there's not, <clears throat> we haven't found a single muscle that can reach 100% of its involuntary activation. It's, yeah. Every muscle is leaving probably about at least 2% in the tank. Yeah. And Which could mean a lot, you know, when you're talking about competition. Yeah, that's massive. I mean, that's a huge difference. That's the difference between first and third or fourth place in a lot of these, especially the Olympics we yeah. just watched. Huge difference. That's a gold medal, you yep. know. Um, and I think, yeah, you, you talk about ammonia capture. I think there was recent studies showed they had yeah. no effect, but of course, that's studies. Yeah, I see. <laughs> they also didn't have Some a 300 pound. Some studies are dumb, because yeah. I can tell you right now, ammonia caps help. Dude, you want to <laughs> fight when you have one of those. Yeah. But you combine one of those. Get a we need to redo pound. that. We that's do. a that's dumb. Yeah. Whoever did that research is. I'm sorry, you did it wrong. <laughs> it was probably a graduate student who never did research in in their life. Untrained subjects. Untrained subjects. They were doing it for their thesis, and the untrained subjects who felt like they were getting punched in the nose lost their coordination and couldn't bench heavier. They're seeing stars. They're you know. exactly. 
Ammonia caps work. You, you combine one of those, get a 300-pound man to slap your yeah. back, <laughs> yeah. and then have an audience of 150 people <laughs> watching you lift, you're going to lift more weight. You're going to lift more weight. Especially in the deadlift. Yeah. I, bench and squat, to me, I think there's <clears throat> inherently slightly more skill involved. Yeah. A deadlift, by the end of that competition, I mean, this is powerlifting, not yeah. Olympic weightlifting, is way different. Um, but that deadlift, man, I, I don't think I ever had a competition where I didn't PR by at least 5, not 10%. Yeah. On yeah. Deadlifts. Yeah. You know. No, I mean, in the Olympics, I saw people getting slapped in the face before they <laughs> yeah. went out there. But yep. you know, but the, and I think so. If we also think about, I remember in sports psychology, and we're again, we're giving you tools like, but um, there's something we studied when I was in grad school. We studied what's called aggressive imagery, and basically that if you image something that you really didn't like, you know, I know Fernando has some certain things that he's been telling me about the last couple weeks. But if you image something you really don't like, that it basically raises arousal and makes you lift heavier, okay? So that's called aggressive imagery. You can imagine someone you don't like. Um, <clears throat> it may actually uh, unleashes, uh, lowers those inhibition mechanisms and makes you be able to lift actually heavier. So I think that goes to the psychology of training, mm -hmm. being psychologically prepared. It's another way to train your body to be able yeah. to lift heavier, right? Absolutely. So, um, and again, some of you guys are like, oh, you know what, I don't really care about being stronger. But again, there's a, the, besides being able to lift heavier in a repetition range is going to lead to more muscle growth. It just is, okay? Mm -hmm. So I do think these are very important. So and what, it looks what, cooler. And it looks cooler. Let's be honest. <laughs> it really does look cool, you know? Um, so what el other... Um, what are some other ways you can get bigger, but not strong? neuromuscularly stronger, yeah. but not bigger? Yeah. Um, I think really after we talk about synchronization or coordination, whatever you want to call it, uh, muscle activation, then we get to something called rate coding. Now this is really interesting, and <clears throat> I, the general consensus, or at least the main theory with rate coding, coding is that it's more about speed than strength. Yep. But it, there's a relationship there yeah. because essentially you're you you can not try to lift a heavy weight slow if you have a heavy weight on your back or in your hands you have to think about moving it quickly or else you're just going to get stapled right yeah that's where rate coding comes in there's really fancy ways to say this essentially rate coding is talking about how quickly can your muscles fire in succession or how quickly can your brain send signals to your muscles complete what we call an action potential which is essentially the link between the neuron and the muscle telling it to fire, how quickly can all of that happen? Yep. And it's, you know, it's intriguing stuff. We generally see this, rate coding is more <clears throat> so dependent, or, or I should say fast muscle contractions are more so dependent on rate coding, whereas stronger muscle contractions might just be more dependent on muscle activation itself. But eventually there's going to be, you know, similarities between the two. And we even have studies showing too that strength training uh, causes a greater increase in rate coding than endurance training does, which means that it's definitely playing some sort of role in lifting weights. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. When you're training for, like, rate coding and stuff like that, what do you think about, um, is there a point in strength training, like, for example, um, sticking points? Mm -hmm. You know when someone, mm -hmm. guys are doing a squat and they hit that sticking point, all of a sudden they go down? Mm -hmm. Do you think that rate coding can, can help overcome sticking points? I think it could. I think there's a biomechanics component there's an intention component, and then there's like a specificity component almost. Because that sticking point usually is kind of the most biomechanically difficult part of the lift. So it's just inherent, you're gonna have a part of the lift that's the hardest to overcome. Then there's that rate coding or rate coding or intention component where you weren't trying to move the weight fast enough. Yeah. You, the weight, you allowed yourself to slow down, you know? And if the intention is to fire hard right away, Usually the outcome is that you don't actually stop at yeah. <laughs> the sticking point, right? And then three, we talk about specificity. There's everybody's going to have that weak spot in the lift due to their own unique mechanical advantage. That's where, like, more often than not, somebody's going to get stuck halfway up on a bench press. So we do floor press, board press, spoto press, named after Eric Spoto. He's a world record bench presser. You know, there's a lot of different specific exercises you can use too, in combination with that you know, maximal intended velocity kind of <clears throat> intention, essentially. 
So what do you think some techniques are to increase that rate of firing? Would you think of stuff like um, bands, potentially? Yeah, bands are great, especially if we're talking about going through sticking points. You have a band that's adding tension as you go. Your only way out is to lift faster. Yeah. If you try to lift slow against a band, it's going to say no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going down. You yep. have to go up to go, you know, not yep. get crushed. Yep. So I think bands are great. Um, dynamic effort training, we've talked about a ton in the past. Yep. Just speed training in general. Um, and jumping, like plyometrics. I know bodybuilders are never going to do that. Never, but no. You see a lot of powerlifters, yeah. especially ones that are following that classic conjugate system. Yeah. They're doing a lot of weighted jumps, depth drops, stuff like that, because they're getting that. You know that's that's as fast as you can move in weight room is jumping. Right. You know, so I think that's a great way to, to increase. That well, design. and there's some evidence. There's some evidence that like doing plyometrics can increase growth. You know, yeah. you know, because it's so if violent. It's a totally new <clears throat> stimulus, which for most of us it is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And power training. There's mm -hmm. evidence too that power training can, like you talked about, moving lighter weight fast can cause some muscle damage. And I think it's also a way to like um, increase your f training frequency without causing a lot of damage. So if I'm lifting lighter and explosive, I, it, it can help somewhat, a little bit with growth maybe, um, but it doesn't really cause a lot of um, damage anyway, you know? I think even, even there it could have the indirect improvement <coughs> on growth because it's helping you in your route to getting stronger, which then helps you get bigger. Yep. You know, it's, it's one of the pieces of the puzzle. It is. Um, so those are those are a couple. Of, any other a, a neural adaptation you think? Yeah, of? there's one, and it, I, I don't really think there's a sense to train it because it's going to happen either way. But that's just antagonist inhibition. Yeah. So essentially, if you're doing, I think the easier way to visualize like a triceps push down, your biceps are activated when you first start training as most likely protective mechanism of the joint. If I'm all of a sudden out of nowhere doing a very forceful <coughs> elbow extension, my body's like, whoa, you're going to snap yeah. your elbow off biceps going and reel that, you know, keep that safe. Yeah. As you train that biceps, you know, activation will reduce and allow your triceps to, you know, essentially have less overall resistance. But yeah. I don't really think there's a purposeful way to train that. Right. Isolation exercises maybe, but it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. And, and I think also uh, the question is this, if we think about the nervous system as being like your software, okay, and you have your hardware which are the muscles. Um, are there ways, basically, that you can stop, make the program confuse, impair your nervous system from doing things that make you stronger and ultimately long-term bigger? That's the question is, can we do things to interfere with this writing this optimal software for growth? I mean, there's a <clears throat> lot of ways to take that question. I think getting hurt is the number one way to do that. Yeah, well, that, that, well, definitely that's the number one, definitely getting hurt. Yeah. Um, is it one way now and of course and we had to do a whole podcast on this but probably doing the opposite right mm -hmm. so like guys who are I'm sorry but if you're like doing 40% of your 1RM deal failure you're not gonna get stronger. it's not gonna make you stronger I, I would argue it's probably gonna think about this for a second if I'm training my body if I have to do 50 repetitions okay right Maybe it was better for my muscles to fire asynchronously. Maybe it's better for my muscles not to activate all at once. Right? Um, and in fact, there are studies with endurance athletes. When you look at their quads, not only are they the muscle fibers firing asynchronously, remember you have quadricep. There's studies that show that, like, <clears throat> for a minute, maybe my vastus, my, the teardrop muscle might be firing more than the outer sweep, the vastus lateralis. And then when that tires out, the vastus lateralis will start firing. And the rectus femoris will, you know, and, and so that your actual heads of the, of the muscle will be firing asynchronously. So you have to think about really, again, what your goals are at the time. So if you're like, I am ramping up for a powerlifting competition, you need to realize that lower intensity um, exercise, that doing exercises that are not um, maximal intended velocity may impair that out of, and probably, Charlie, that's why I was so weak when I was, you know, when I was at my max yeah. bodybuilding, because I was doing, I was like, everything was controlled. Yeah. I didn't try and use momentum. You know, it was stuff like that. Um, it was interesting enough. So I think just realize that what you're doing um, 
your goals will dictate a lot of things when it comes to like being stronger or not. Well, I think a good example of that too is, you know, we're trying to do this offset bench and squat and stuff. That is hard. It's hard. Like even a two and a half percent offset on squat, I can, I had a hard time doing two, well, it ended up being 290 pounds for like six reps. That should be nothing for me. And I'm humble and all that stuff. That's not that hard of a weight yeah. to do. But if I had that weight offset and I had to think about being, you know, symmetrical and in my squat and everything, that was really hard. It's hard. You know, it's hard. Yeah. But if I take that off and I'm allowed to have whatever asymmetry I have, yeah, I'll blow that through the roof. I yeah. can jump with that weight. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that's, I think that's one of those things too, where there's the quest for perfect symmetry, obviously, but then there's also the quest for optimal performance. Yeah. And you have to pick which one you want. Yeah. Exactly right. So now let's go into this. <clears throat> We talk about down. We're going to go into some interesting studies. You just wrote an article that's going to get released on the MusclePhD.com. Yeah, hopefully this week. I should have time. <laughs> yeah, so guys, stay tuned for this great article on this topic. But you found something interesting when you were delving into the literature, right? Mm -hmm. um, you looked at studies that basically looked at the increase in the increase in muscle growth and how that related to strength. Mm -hmm. And you looked at studies on the upper body. Which, which in this case was biceps, mm -hmm. and you looked at uh, research on the lower body, which is this case was the quadriceps. What was the interesting thing that you found? Tell us about what you found with the quads and then the biceps. Yeah, so I think all along we've kind of so far talked about, <clears throat> you know, is a bigger muscle a stronger muscle? Just taking, you know, X versus Y. Well, now we're looking at as the muscle gets bigger, does it get stronger at an equal proportion? And so, you know, these studies that we're doing this stuff, we talked about correlations before. You first have to find the correlation. You, you have to measure multiple adaptations, change in muscle size, change in, um, you know, EMG amplitude or activation, a couple other things. You look at those and find the correlation to the change in strength. And then we can do, again, I, I like simplicity, simple regression, but some other people are going to do, you know, multivariate regressions and all this stuff. But the regression essentially is a calculation that shows us how a change in variable A can predict a change in variable B. Or so, say you have three things. You have change in muscle activation, change in muscle size, change in the time of day. I don't know, something random out there. Then you have change in muscle strength on the other side. How can each of these three things <coughs> predict the change in muscle strength? We do a regression calculation to figure that out. So. With that boring part out of the way, we have to explain it though. Um, what we're finding is that in the quads, we have one really, really well done study, one of my favorite studies of recent time actually, showing that change in EMG or activation had a better correlation to change in strength than change in muscle size did. In fact, the change in activation could explain about 31% of the change in strength, whereas the change in size only explained about 18%. Okay. Now, a very, uh, one of the same authors from that study a few years back had done the same thing with the biceps, looking at bicep curls, strength changes, all this stuff. And intriguingly, what they found is that growth or muscle size was much better correlated with strength as opposed to activation. In fact, a change in bicep size explained 27% of bicep strength, where activation only explained 3% basically didn't do anything at all. So again, we don't have very many studies on this topic, but like what everybody else does in exercise science, let's go ahead and draw conclusions, yeah, right? Let's do you it. Know? I think we can. But I think my theory on this anyways, and I, you know, there's, we have these two studies, we have a few other ones that we can kind of, you know, draw bits and pieces from. But essentially my theory is that these smaller muscles, like the biceps, the triceps, the pecs, relative to the quads or, or bigger muscles like that, those muscles, I think, are more so dependent on getting bigger for them to get stronger, whereas the quads, the glutes, the abs, the traps to an extent, these bigger muscles that don't activate as well, they need those neuromuscular adaptations to get stronger. Mm -hmm. And I think a good observational anecdote for that is we look at the training of the top IFBB pro bodybuilders. They all bench 500 pounds, give or take. Yeah. You look at the training or the or you know the the, the performance of the top power lifters, these you know 242s, 275s, like those guys are benching five five fifty maybe, 
pounds, not kilograms. But then look at the difference in squats. Huge. Bodybuilders, maybe six, 700 pounds, they train heavy. Ronnie Coleman was different. Yeah. He was also a powerlifter. But yeah. these 242, 275s, these guys are getting 900, sometimes 1,000 pound squats. It's crazy. Raw. Crazy. I think Eric Lillybridge was well over 1,000. It's crazy. Andre Milinich has been over 1,000. I mean, we <clears throat> have multiple guys that squatted over 1,000 pounds. You'll never see a bodybuilder yeah. do that. Yeah. So anecdotally, we're seeing that muscle size is helping bodybuilding bench press a lot, but it's not helping squat performance a lot. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about the correlation between pec size and, and bench press performance being very, very strong. The relationship between quad size and squat performance is not strong at all. Yeah. It's almost non-existent, yeah. actually. Yeah. So I think that's the point. What Charlie's basically saying is that these larger muscles, they – at, if they're hard to fully activate. Smaller muscles like the biceps aren't hard to fully activate. So maybe, you know, it's, it is more explained by a growth thing, upper body strength, lower body strength. You're going to have to lift heavy to get stronger mm -hmm. on, you know what I'm saying? So I think that that is a really important outcome. And that's a really good anecdote kind of comparing the top power lifters yeah. to bodybuilders. Um, and those are good studies. And I'll tell you, in my, all of my, I've done a lot of studies a couple hundred studies the one study i've never done is one that tests maximal bicep strength <laughs> <laughs> you'd never think the muscle phd no, i've never done that study before so my have you ever maxed on curls i've never maxed oh on you're curls. missing out my friend <laughs> we when i was working at ball state we would pop ammonia caps <laughs> slap each other's backs and then go max on a strict curl <laughs> that's great that man. was the best time <laughs> <laughs> so, but you guys see the point. So I think um, kind of take home message on this is if we were to take, take home message, one thing is it's not just the hardware, it's the software. And particularly when you look at lower body, if you're going to make your lower body strong, uh, stronger and have the capacity to lift heavier in like that hypertrophy range, you're probably going to have to have some more heavy days. You can't mm -hmm. just train your traditional 8 to 12 reps, 12 to 15 reps. Um, there, there is something to like doing the heavier one to five rep days, even five to eight rep days, longer rest period lengths. Um, it's important to, to, you know, have good form um, and, th and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So what, what are your, any other thoughts on practical applications? I, yeah, I think a top takeaway here is something that a lot of power lifters are doing intuitively <laughs> is that you might not have to bench press that heavy that often to get a stronger bench press. Oh. You can train upper body more so like a power lifter and still get a great bench press. I mean, I remember I was never into competitive bodybuilding, but I liked to build my body essentially. And then I bled into powerlifting. And what I realized when I moved from bodybuilding to powerlifting, they kicked the crap out of my squat and deadlift, but I benched more than everybody in my weight class wow. because I had trained like a bodybuilder for wow. so long. That's very... And, you know, I was only benching 320 pounds maybe, but at 181, it's not a big weight class. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of these other guys are stuck at like 275. It's because they just keep doing singles and doubles of That's bench. That's really like, interesting. Just get bigger and you're going to get a bigger bench. That's really, you know? really interesting. And so really I, I think, and I think a lot of powerlifters do that intuitively. And again, if you're a competitive powerlifter, you should practice benching heavy because it's your sport. But as far as your off season training, get bigger. Yeah. You're going to get a stronger bench that way. Yeah. So guys, I think anything else? I think that's about it. So, guys, thank you so much for, for joining <coughs> us here today. I'm super excited to talk to you. Um, Fernando, anything? Uh, just, I'm gonna uh, like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, yeah. Guys, if this is your first time to the channel, um, make sure you hit that like button. Subscribe if you want to support the channel. Share it. Um, tell your friends. And uh, go out and get bigger, get stronger. Both yes. are important. We'll Very. talk to you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys.